Hi everybody, my name is Karen and I was so blessed to be able to travel to Israel in March of 2023 and then invited to talk to the congregation about my travels and share some of the things that I learned and experienced. And after that, there was a couple people that wanted to know if we could maybe post that to our YouTube channel. So that is what this video is. Welcome. But first, a little disclaimer, I was one person in a really large group and we were so privileged to be able to have scholars and experts and people that had been there so many times and were just so well spoken about so many different things, theologically, culturally, politically, economically, you can't imagine all the depths of knowledge that we had access to. I hope that I recorded everything that I learned accurately. If there's any comments or questions, please let me know and I'll do a little bit more research and get back to you. So first, where is Israel? It is located on the Mediterranean Sea in the Middle East. It's about 15 hours by flight from San Francisco. The country is slightly larger than the state of New Jersey, but half the size of the Lake of Michigan. It is an amazingly diverse country. It has snowy peaks. There's actually a ski resort in one of the peaks, but it also has over 137 beaches. The group I was with flew into Tel Aviv and then spent the night there traveling north up to the Sea of Galilee, staying in Tiberias. We did get to go to the Lebanon and Syrian borders and then down to the Dead Sea and then spending the final days of our trip in Jerusalem. The first stop on our tour was Caesarea Maritima, which is located on the Mediterranean Sea. It was built by Herod the Great, who was quite a prolific builder. He also made the Cave of the Patriarchs in Hebron, the Palace of Jericho. He enlarged the Temple Mount platform and temple in Jerusalem, and then the Rock Fortress kind of over by the Dead Sea, which there are pictures of later in this presentation. It was named for the Roman Empire, Augustus Caesar, and in this location, the harbor was greatly expanded, but there was also a focus on education, so there's an amphitheater, which still hosts live concerts today, and then entertainment. There was a racetrack in this area as well. Found in this area is what's called the Pontius Pilate Stone, which was discovered in 1961. Before that point, there was no archaeological evidence of the existence of Pilate whatsoever. So skeptics and critics did question if he was a real individual. They found this stone, not only describing his name, but also his position. And it was likely that he made his home in Caesarea Maritima and would go to Jerusalem for the feasts and the high holidays. It's very interesting in Israel, there are so many finds and not one of them that they have discovered in all the centuries have ever contradicted what has been told in the Bible, which of course is inherent and true. In these pictures, you can see the harbor, but you can also see the racetrack area and then the amphitheater. The racetrack area was likely later used as a gladiator pit, and it's likely that Christians were martyred in this area. It's also likely that Paul was imprisoned here. There are 15 mentions in the Bible of Caesarea Maritima, and all of them took place in the book of Acts. In Acts 10, Cornelius is the first Gentile to receive the Holy Spirit, and he lived in Caesarea here. Paul sailed from here in Acts 21, and really we see the gospel reaching out through the world in this location. It's a great place to start a trip to Israel. Mount Carmel is not actually one specific peak, but is the whole mountain range. And this is approximately the location in which Elisha called down fire and had his showdown between the false gods and prophets and, of course, our true and mighty and powerful God. In 1 Kings 18.21, he asks, How long will you go limping between two options? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him him. In addition to being the place where Elisha called down fire and had that confrontation with the false prophets, this area was also very prominent in the book of Judges. So to the left kind of mid quarter of this picture, that is the approximate location of one of the battles, Deborah and Jael 
managed. And then over on the right side of the picture, that is kind of the Gideon spring area where God decreased Gideon's army all the way down to 300 to showcase his strength and his power. And then it was a kind of hazy day, but there is a little bump in the middle of that picture, kind of far in the distance. And that is actually Nazareth. So that is the place where Jesus grew up when they returned from Egypt. So just to imagine him in this lush um, and vegetative area, but so ripe with history and hearing these stories and walking in these places and knowing the Bible and knowing that it's all real and he was the word in flesh. It's quite a picture. It's quite an image. This is the area of Medigo, or the Tell of Medigo. It's about 60 miles north of Jerusalem and is a very strategically important location. There's kind of a valley there, so it has it's kind of higher up. It's very um, easy to defend, and so it was fought over a lot. Countless battles, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Greeks, even going into World War I and then the Arab-Israeli War in 1948. Very conflicted area. It's also the place in the future where the Battle of Armageddon will take place, so some conflict coming. Historically, biblically, very significant. A lot of passages refer to this place, and it was likely where Solomon kept all of his horses. So that middle picture there is actually a manger, which would have been made of stone, not like the Christmas pageants we remember when it was made of wood, but a carved stone manger. Because this area was so conflicted, there were so many battles here, one civilization would come in and fight and then destroy and then build on top of the previous one and then layer upon layer. To date, there have been 26 confirmed layers of settlements and a multitude of discoveries made. This picture here kind of shows how they took a wedge of the hill out to dig down and discover all the different layers there. Some of the finds that have been discovered include a high place, which is a object of worship. It would be where there would be sacrifices, be them objects or children or people. There was also a flight of stone steps discovered around the 7th century. And then as a way to get water, they made a vertical shaft downward and then a 70 meter tunnel sloping upward to access a spring. This was actually done hundreds of years before King Hezekiah had a similar tunnel built near Jerusalem and had a better um, and result, they, they met in the middle, two different teams were digging it, and they met in the middle with less margin of error than Hezekiah's teams did. So a little trivia knowledge for you there. It's 187 steps down and 77 steps back up. So Medigo is mentioned in Joshua, in 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and then a lot in Judges. But the New Testament does not mention Medigo, but Revelation 16.16 16 mentions Armageddon. Armageddon refers to a future battle between God and the forces of evil, and demonic influences will cause the kings of the earth to gather their armies and then create an assault on Jerusalem. The Antichrist will be leading the charge. This is all in Revelation 16. Um, but Jesus Christ will return to earth with the armies of heaven. It's Matthew 25 and Revelation 19. And he will stand on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14. He will defeat evil, Revelation 19. Cast the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire. Bind Satan and set up his millennial kingdom on earth. That's Revelation 21 through 6. At Armageddon, Jesus trends the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And all things will be made right very significant place here. So these are just some pictures of the next morning dawn on the Sea of Galilee. One thing that I did not know traveling to Israel was how many different species of birds there would be. There's over 500 million birds migrating through the area to and from Europe and Africa and Asia each spring and fall. And Israel is a very strategic place where you can see all the different birds migrating and stopping and resting. And there's so many different species. It's just really amazing to sit and watch for a minute. 
This is the Mount of Beatitudes. It is the spot where Jesus is believed to have delivered his sermon on the Mount. There is a church in this area that is octagonal and it has one side dedicated to each of the Beatitudes or the Blessed Be. Another translation of those words is the, oh how happy, oh how happy. So next time you're reading Matthew 5, um, Try to, try to think of that. Oh, how happy. But it's a beautiful area. It is higher up and it overlooks the Sea of Galilee. Capernaum is about three kilometers away and below this area is likely the location where Jesus taught the parable of the sower in Mark 4. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Magdala is a major first century port on the Sea of Galilee. It was a center for trade and exporting and is on the western side of the sea between Tiberias and Capernaum. These ruins were discovered in 1960. Also discovered were paved streets, water canals, baths, a marketplace, and a synagogue. They also found pottery, perfume jars, combs, and jewelry. This is what the ruins of Magdala look like. There's only one mention of this place in the New Testament. It is in Matthew 15, 39. And after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magdala. Both Matthew and Mark say that Jesus preached in synagogues throughout Galilee, and Magdala was only 10 kilometers from Capernaum, where he based his ministry. This is the Magdala Synagogue. You can see on the right side, that would be part of the ritual purity baths, the living water that was channeled in so they could be ritually made clean. And then you can see on the left side, ruins of the actual synagogue. Now rebels fortified the city in the first Jewish revolt in about AD 66 to 70. And there was a very huge bloody sea battle with the Romans right in this location. Because that battle was so bloody, there was nothing else built over these ruins because it was considered unclean. That's why we have these ruins preserved from the time of Jesus. It's really rare that there wouldn't be something else or multiple other layers of civilizations over the top of it. But because of that battle, we have these ruins and it was very likely that Jesus taught here. Here are a few additional pictures of the Magdala Synagogue. During this time, it was custom for the rabbi or the teacher to sit during a teaching and the students to stand. So you can picture Jesus sitting here and giving teachings. This is the area of Capernaum where Jesus called his home. It was also the home of some of Jesus' disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, John, and Matthew. Unlike the synagogue at Magdala, this synagogue here was likely built well after Jesus' time. However, the foundations it was built upon, this newer one was built upon, that was likely a synagogue in which Jesus taught, specifically mentioned in Mark 1 and then later in John 6 when he gives the I am the bread of life lesson. The original synagogue was built by a Roman centurion, the same centurion who had his servant healed after a declaration of faith that amazed Jesus and that is the story in Luke chapter 7. As this area was also the hometown of Peter, this is what is believed to be his home. You can only see a small portion of the ruins as there is an ultra-modern Catholic church which was built in 1990, built over the top of it. So you can kind of glance in between the ground and this risen church and view the ruins. This is likely where Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law as well. 
Jesus has did the majority of his ministry and miracles in about seven square miles. And in Matthew 11, verses 20 through 24, Jesus curses Capernaum, Bethesda, and Chorazan because so many, where he did so many, the majority of his ministry rejected him and refused to believe in him. All three of those places today are little more than just tourist stops. They're not bustling metropolises. They're not all that impressive. One visitor to the ruins way back in 1838 said the whole place just stinks of being mournful and desolate. Cursed indeed. There's just a couple more pictures of a sunrise on the Sea of Galilee. In addition to having palm trees, they also have banana trees, they have date palms, they have avocado groves, anything that you can imagine. It is a very, very beautiful, very plentiful place. And everyone should try a date with peanut butter. It sounds weird, but trust me, it's delicious. So this is Caesarea Philippi. It's also called Banis. It's interesting because it was named for Pan, who was a half man, half god deity, often depicted as playing a flute. Now, his name Pan is where we get the word panic because whenever you were in nature, when you were in the woods and you heard some kind of creepy sounds, they would attribute that to this false god. And that's where we get the word panic. But because the, in um, Arabic, there isn't a letter P, they changed the name to Banis. Now this area is about 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus came here exclusively to give one teaching. He here asked his disciples who do, you, who do people say that the Son of Man is? This is in Matthew 16. Now, this area was a huge area for practices of false gods. There were um, false temples here. There was an altar. There was a lot of just really terrible practices going on here. It would be almost the equivalent of Vegas. It had a reputation, not a good reputation, but it had a reputation. And yet this is the, the location that Jesus went out of his way to go and to ask his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And it is also a very rocky area. You can kind of tell in that picture how many huge boulders there are. So surrounded by these rocks in this area of gross and, and rampant pagan worship, Jesus founds his church, not on Peter, on any man, and Peter's name actually means pebble, but on the foundational truth that Peter, through the power of the Holy Spirit, declares. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the area where Jesus founds his church. He's not like John the Baptist who was coming, baptizing in fire. He's not like Elijah who had the power of signs. He's not like Jeremiah who had tender-hearted, weeping, compassionate care. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. A couple other cool sites and stops. We visited the border of Lebanon and the border of Syria and spent a lot of time talking about the history of Israel and the inaccurate representations of Israel around the world, especially in around current events and conflicts. We talked a little bit about armed services and things like that. Additionally, we traveled to the Jordan River, which is the picture on the right there, and we participated in baptisms. This is the area of Beit Shem, which is a, a strategic junction between the Jezreel and the Jordan Valleys. It's about eight miles south of the Sea of Galilee and is the most extensive archaeological site in Israel. It's a huge area. It is biblically significant as this is where the Philistines fastened Saul's body. Um, they put his armor in their temple and they fastened his body to the wall here after he fell on his sword. This is the story in 1 Samuel 31. It's also mentioned in Judges. It was a bustling city in the time of Jesus and he would have known about it very likely. Um, and it was so bustling until about the 4th century. It was destroyed by an earthquake in the year 749. 
Some of the discoveries here include a three-tiered theater, which is that larger picture there. It seats about 7,000 people. There is also an amphitheater, which holds about 6,000, where gladiators were made to compete against each other and animals and entertain soldiers. That was actually located out of the city, so the city would not be unclean. So that was a little bit of a walk away from this area. Some other discoveries in this area was a very complex bath and gym system. There was um, a decorative fountain, a lot of columns, streets, buildings, roads, things like that. There's about 18 layers of occupation down to the first settlers, which were thought to be around 4000 BC. This is the Dead Sea, which is about 16 miles east of Jerusalem. It's kind of long and narrow in shape. It is mentioned about 16 times in the Bible and sits at 1,300 feet below sea level. It is the lowest point on Earth's surface. It also has unusually high salt context at about a 26%. So it is the saltiest body of water on the earth, five times the level of salt, um, more salty than the ocean. There's no marine life here. Uh, you do float, you don't swim. But the crazy thing is that pro the prophet Ezekiel forced saw a time in which the Dead Sea's toxic, salty waters would be transformed into a fresh river of life flowing water, um, all throwing, flowing from the throne of God. And he talks about that in chapter 47, verses 8 through 12 of his book. In recent times, however, the Dead Sea has been shrinking because the waters are evaporating faster than the inflow from the Jordan River and the other streams. So it loses approximately three feet of coast, or three feet of coast are exposed each year as it is shrinking that much. This is Masada, which is a rock top fortress overlooking the Dead Sea. Uh, Herod the Great built it as kind of a re refuge, a place of rest for him. It is elaborately designed and has three different tiers. The a fortress has three different tiers cascading down the face of the cliff. And each tier is connected by a staircase, which is cut into the rock. This is the view from the gondola going up to the top of the rock fortress. These are more pictures of Masada, the actual rock top fortress, which overlooks the Dead Sea. Here there were elaborate bathhouses with uh, even a pool, and then a hot room with flo the floor suspended on low pillars, allowing hot air from a furnace to be circulated under the floor through, and then through clay pipes in the walls, kind of to uh, create a spa-like experience. Still in the Dead Sea region, we traveled to Engedi, which is now a nature preserve. It has always been an oasis in the desert. It's west of the Dead Sea, and this is where David fled from Saul. He was running from Saul for about 10 years of his life, and he hid in Engedi for some of that time. This is also where he hid in the caves when Saul then went into one of the caves and David cut off a portion of his robe, and is also where he probably wrote Psalm 57, Psalm 63, and Psalm 142, all Psalms of David. Ingedi also means spring of the young goat, and there are ibex goats in this area that have the ability to climb up the rock and balance on very, very small, very narrow ledges. It is also a place of a lot of different types of vegetation. So the tree on the left there, that is actually made with thorns. It has very large, sharp thorns and was likely the type of branches that they used to make into a crown for Jesus during his crucifixion. Engedi is also important in the end times. In the future, Engedi will witness the miraculous renewal of the Dead Sea, which we just talked about was so full of salt. And yet Ezekiel prophesies that the Dead Sea will become a fresh water body teeming with life. So we're looking forward to that restoration and Jesus coming. These are a few pictures of different blooms and flowering plants in the desert. And it just really made me think of Isaiah 35, which is talking about the restoration of Israel by God. And the promise was true in the immediate terms when Judah was restored after the evasion of the Assyrians. 
And it was true again in 1948 when modern-day Israel, who turned the wilderness and the wasteland into productive farms after they were established as a country, and the desert began to blossom like a rose. And the promise will be true again in the ultimate fulfillment of the prophecy when God restores the whole earth, the whole world, at the end of the Great Tribulation. So it's Isaiah 35, 1, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad, the desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It continues on with beautiful language, and just God's beauty is reflected even in these desert flowers. And these flowers too, the red poppies were in blossom when I was there. And then those are daisies near the old city of Jerusalem. In the Middle East, in Jerusalem, you have to have pictures of camels. So this is a grouping of camels that we saw on the way up to Jerusalem. No matter where you are coming from, you are always going up to Jerusalem. You are ascending to Jerusalem. It is a higher elevation. It is kind of set on a hill, but that's just the language that you always use. You also speak or sing the Psalms of Ascent when you are traveling to Jerusalem, and that is Psalms 120 to 134. Next up is Jerusalem, which is a city of great importance to the Jews. This was the city King David made the capital. It's where the temple stood, and that contained the Ark of the Covenant. For Christians, this location is significant as it is where Christ died, was buried, and rose again. It's also where he is coming back, and it is the birthplace of the church. The Bible, both the Old and New Testament, mentioned Jerusalem several hundred times. Muslims believe Muhammad ascended to heaven from the Temple Mount. They also believe that Abraham attempted to sacrifice Ishmael, not Isaac, in and around the Temple Mount area, but never once is Jerusalem mentioned in the Quran. At Jerusalem's heart is the walled city, divided into four different quarters, the Muslim quarter, the Christian quarter, the Jewish quarter, and the Armenian quarter. And the Muslim quarter is the largest and most populated. It includes the Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock, um, the Pools of Bethesda. The Christian quarter contains the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The Jewish quarter contains access to the Western Wall. The Armenian quarter has a couple of different museums in it. So different places to visit in each of these walled quarters inside the actual walled portion of the city. Jerusalem is a very religious place, very cultured place, with over 1,200 synagogues, more than 50, 150 churches, which represent 17 denominations, and more than 70 mosques. It's a very interesting experience to walk around and hear both the Muslim calls to worship, but also prayers being spoken in Aramaic, in Hebrew, there's Greek, um, different translations being offered there as well. These are just a collection of different pictures from Jerusalem. The top gate picture is the gate into the Muslim quarter. There were just a herd of goats walking around, so that's always a fun picture. The picture in the middle is of the Jewish quarter for lunch, and then the picture on the right is lavender near the southern steps in the Jewish quarter adjacent to the western wall. Again, Jerusalem is mentioned in a variety of different scriptures and is just very significant both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's really fun to walk around the Jewish quarter, any parts in the wall within the walls of the old city and see the different shops and stores, the spice market, just hear the different calls to prayer and see the different food preparations and things for sale and just try to immerse yourself in the different languages and cultures and learn a little bit about each of the different people groups that are there and what claim they have there and what God they follow. This is a picture of just outside of the walled portion of the city going into a different location and just seeing the different landscape and the topography there. In John chapter 5, describing the healing of the man at the pools who had been paralyzed for 38 years. John gives a lot of details on the structure of the pools, it having five porticles, and until the 1900s, nothing like that, nothing fitting that description had been discovered, and so many people doubted if it happened at all, or maybe said that John elaborated the detail of the five porticles, trying to remind people of the five books of Moses, or just add extra details. However, it was discovered in the 1900s exactly as John described. 
The pools of Bethesda are about 165 feet to 200 feet wide by 315 feet long. It is divided into two pools by a central partition, a bridge in the middle. It's only been partially excavated because it is in the Muslim quarter and abuts the Muslim area. However, everything that has been discovered is exactly as they said with the five porticles, the, com the columns, and all of the depth of the pool. It's exactly as it was written. You'll remember in the Gospel of John in chapter 5 in this story that there were a multitude of invalids of the blind, the lame, the paralyzed that lay at this pool waiting for the waters to be stirred up so that they could enter the pool and perhaps receive healing. And Jesus saw one man lying there, knowing he had already been there a long time. And so he asked him, do you want to be healed? And the sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up and while I am going down, another steps in before me. And Jesus says, Get up, take your bed and walk. And at once this man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Jesus only talked to one person. Or only, it's only recorded that Jesus talked to one person, healed one person among the multitudes here. And that's sometimes a really hard lesson because we're all praying for things. But maybe today pray... Who could be that one person in your life that Jesus, that God is directing you to talk to, you to engage with, you to show the Father's love to, you to ask questions and, and develop a relationship and shine Jesus' light to? Who is that one person for you today? This is the Garden of Gethsemane. Of course, it is near the Mount of Olives. It's about 1,200 square meters in area. It was well known to the disciples. It is a very close path to the temple. It was also two kilometers away from the location in which they shared the Passover meal in the upper room. And because that was a holiday, a Sabbath, you were not allowed to walk more than two kilometers at one time. So it's very likely that they knew of this area and would rest here before they continued on in their journey. The name in Hebrew means oil press, and just meditate on that for a little bit. Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus went to pray, where the disciples fell asleep three times. To press olives means to put an amazing amount of pressure, press, press, press down. And that's what Jesus felt here in this area. He was praying so much. He was praying blood, drops of blood, sweating blood. He was under such indescribable pressure. And yet the disciples fell asleep. And yet the disciples fled. And yet we forget. We forget what he did for us. So let's remember that. Not just when we're in this place, this beautiful place filled with really old olive trees, but always let's remember what he did for us. Inside the walls of the city in the Christian quarter is a place called the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which is one possible location of the tomb of Jesus. This is another. It's called the Garden Tomb. Now, according to scriptures, Jesus was crucified in a place called the Skull, which is Golgotha in Aramaic. And in the mid-19th century, several Christian scholars suggested that there was a rocky hill area which can be viewed from this garden the garden tomb area that could possibly be the place where jesus was crucified they noted the proximity to the main city gate it was outside the walls so the city would not be unclean with the dead bodies of the criminals and yet it was near the road so that anyone entering in would be warned and the passerbyers mocked jesus we know that from the bible um, so this is a possible location of both the crucif crucifixion, the hill on which Jesus died, but also the garden tomb area as a place where he was entombed. So in John chapter 19, it says, At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Archaeological evidence, including an ancient wine press, which is the picture here, suggests that this place, the garden tomb, was a garden in those days, and inside the garden was an ancient Jewish tomb, perhaps the empty tomb of Jesus. This is a picture of the outside of that tomb. There's a lot of things that you can notice about it, but I just encourage you to just contemplate what happened here. It might not have been at this exact location, but it's probably within about two miles. So 
it, it could not be here, but it, it still happened. And in this area, you can walk in to the tomb and I can testify that it is absolutely empty. He is not there. He has risen just as he said. Outside the walls of the city is something called the city of David. So when David originally tried to make Jerusalem the capital, he didn't live where the walls are now, where the Temple Mount is. Instead, he lived on a ridge very close to it, adjacent to this area. King Hezekiah and Josiah also probably lived here, along with Isaiah and Jeremiah. In 2 Samuel 5, this is where King David captured the fortress, and it's about a 12-acre area where he established his capital and a tent for the ark before Solomon later made the temple over just a little bit to the north. This is a view from what's now still called the City of David. And archaeologically in this area, they found a dozen of clay seals. Some of the seals have been have names confirmed from the Bible. They're also mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 36 and in 1 Chronicles 9. One even contains the name Bethlehem, which is the first mention of this ancient city outside of the Bible. So there have been a lot of very cool discoveries here in this area in the city of David. And it's also an interesting vantage point. You can kind of see the Arab um, area outside of the walls of the city at this point, and you can see how Jerusalem is set on a hill and there are different valleys. You can kind of understand the lay of the land a little bit better here. The other fun thing to do in the city of David is explore Hezekiah's tunnel. Now, this was cut under the city of David in about 701 BC under Hezekiah's leadership due to, as a result of conflict with the Assyrians, he needed to sure up a supply of water so that it could be easily defended and they could have good water supply even if they were under siege. The tunnel is about 1,750 and 50 feet long, curving and weaving. Two crews were cutting in different directions and meeting in the middle. So the first portion of the tunnel is very short and the other section, they were digging a little shallower and had to kind of redo it. So that one's a little bit taller. It was cut to bring water from Gibbon Springs in the Kildren Valley into Jerusalem. It was cut by two crews working in different directions. You can still see the pickaxe marks and it is still a wet tunnel. So there is water flowing through it today. So the tunnel is about, it averages 23 and a half inches wide and six and a half feet tall. I ducked quite a few times and I am not six and a half feet tall. It is also a wet tunnel. So when you step in the water, when I was there, went well above my knee. It was surprisingly not cold, the water, but continued through the length of the tunnel and was about calf or ankle height. It is amazingly dark, so you have uh, headlamps, you have flashlights, and you are just amazingly <laughs> underneath the city in an area in which they built out of necessity hundreds and hundreds of years ago. This is a picture from the Southern Steps showing the Mount of Olives, which is on the east side of Jerusalem, biblically very significant. David fled over there. Solomon turned away from God there. Ezekiel and Jeremiah had um, visions there. Jesus traveled there a lot. It is um, where he foretold a lot of things. He prayed there. He ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives and he will reappear there. So in Jewish tradition, the Messiah, not Jesus in Jewish tradition, will descend from the Mount of Olives on Judgment Day and enter Jerusalem through the Golden Gate, which has now been blocked over as a way to keep the Messiah out. I won't stop him. But for this reason, Jews have often sought to be buried on the slopes of the Mount of Olives, thinking that as the Messiah descended from the Mount of Olives to the Gate of Mercy, the beautiful gates, the Golden Gate, that he would catch them and take them with him.
As Christians, we know the Mount of Olives is where he will appear, but it's also really interesting to just pause for a second and think about the Southern Steps. Now, the Southern Steps were an access point to the temple, to the Temple Mount area. It is access to the, the courtyards up there, so you wouldn't just immediately enter the temple. You would enter into the courtyards after going up the Southern Steps. They are spaced unevenly, so you cannot run up them. You have to deliberately walk, take your time, contemplate what you're doing, where you're going, who you're worshiping. You can't just rush about it without thinking about it or you'll trip and fall. The interesting, other interesting thing about the Southern Steps is that there was an entry in which everyone would go and then there was a different exit. Now, those in mourning would appear to be in mourning. They would have different clothes. They would look different in appearance. And they were supposed to both enter and exit through the entry gate, through the entry portion. And the purpose of that was so that the people entering up the steps would see them, would recognize that they are in mourning, and would remember to pray for them when they got to the temple. So they would be fresh in the, pe in the people's minds. So I just contemplate that. I just remember that. Who is God placing in my mind? Who is God placing in my path that I can remember to pray for? As we all earnestly wait with anticipation and with hope for him to come back to appear again on the Mount of Olives. So this is the Western Wall. It is a portion of the retaining wall that would have held up the courtyard area to the Temple Mount. It's, it's not the wall of the temple itself, but a wall of the courtyard further away from the temple. But it is what the Jewish individuals, the Jewish people have access to right now. It is still standing and it is a place of worship and pilgrimage for the Jews. It is a place of prayer. Sometimes it is called the Wailing Wall, but it can also be a place for celebration, bar and bat mitzvahs. About one million notes are left in the Western Wall every year, prayers written down and then placed into the stone crevices. The Israeli Postal Service actually has a special letters department in which if you mail a letter to God, they will take it and place it in the cracks of the wall, which is rather kind service. So if you can't go yourself, you can always mail a letter to God circa the Israeli Postal Service, and that will be placed in, in the Wailing Wall, in the Western Wall. The picture to the right here is of the Robinson Ark, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Just notate that picture. So again, the picture on the right on this slide is what could have been the construction of what is now the Robinson Ark. It was a staircase to go up to the courtyard area. And so here's another different vantage point of the Western Wall. Today, the highest point in the exposed section is about 131 feet tall, and most of the stones weigh between two and eight tons. The biggest stone is estimated at 570 tons. The previous slide, that was a picture of the wall from the prayer plaza, the plaza separated men and women where you go and pray, where you place your notes of prayer. And that has 29 stone layers exposed above ground. It is a total of 46 layers of stone. So that gives you an idea of how tall this area was. 17 layers are under the earth. The above ground section reaches the height of about 62 feet. However, it would have been about 104 feet tall. This portion here could have been about 170, uh, 197 feet tall. This is just another picture with a person in the foreground to show you the size of the stones. Again, estimated to weigh between two and eight tons each. In the destruction of the temple in AD 70, they were overturned. And so all the rubble that you see in these pictures, are that was a conscious decision to leave those there to remember the destruction of the temple. And you can see the size of it. You can see and imagine how grand this area once was and how complete was its destruction just as Jesus foretold, not a stone left. This is an artistic rendering of what the temple 
mount could have looked like. Of course, it is referenced a lot in scripture. You can see the the arc, so the Robinson arc, and then the stairway. You can see the retaining kind of wall area, the white building in the background there in the corner. That would be the actual temple. It is a very large area. This is an artistic rendering of what the temple mount could have looked like. Of course, it is referenced a lot in scripture. You can see the the arc, so the Robinson arc, and then the stairway. You can see the retaining kind of wall area, the white building in the background there in the corner. That would be the actual temple. It is a very large area. This is another picture taken from the Southern Steps area, and just a little bit more background information about the temple. The temple that Jesus knew was rebuilt by Herod the Great, who we remember also built the Caesarea Maritima Amphitheater that we talked about in the beginning, He and um, some other things as well. He was a prolific builder, but Herod extended the Temple Mount area on the north and the south and the west and created just a bigger area there as well. Since the Christian era began, Jerusalem has been ruled by the Roman Empire. First Rome, and then the Byzantines, and then Istanbul, Persians, Arab Muslims, Crusaders, Muslims again, Egyptians, Ottoman Turks, and then from 1917 to 1948, the British. And then after the Arab-Israeli War of 1948, Jerusalem was partitioned between Jordan and the new state of Israel, and Israel gained control of the predominantly Arab East Jerusalem and Old City area during the 1967 Six-Day War. But the status and ownership of Jerusalem remain a key issue in the ongoing Israeli and Palestinian conflict. After that six-day war, Israel left the management in the hands of the Islamic Foundation, so trying to do some compromises there. In this schematic, in this model, you can see how the Temple Mount currently looks. It occupies about one-sixth of the old city, the walled city. And here is a picture of what it looks like today. You can see the walls there. To the right, that gated area, that is the Gate Beautiful, the Mercy Gate, the Golden Gate. You can see the Dome of the Rock and kind of the courtyard area up there. And then you can see to the left side of the picture, the Southern Step area. This is a close-up picture of the Golden Gate, which is also called the Gate of Mercy and the Gate Beautiful. And we know that Jesus will descend from the Mount of Olives and enter through this gate. To stop him, the gate has been bricked over, it has been cemented over, and a Muslim cemetery has been placed in front of it, thinking that the high priest, the Messiah, would not want to become unclean by passing by a cemetery, a graveyard, by dead bodies. We know, of course, that this will not stop him. And he will, of course, come again and reign as king. And I would just encourage you to... As you feel led, pray for that and pray for the people of Israel. Just keep them in your thoughts and your prayers that they would know this Messiah, that they would know Jesus. The Lord your God is one and he is the Son of God, our mighty Savior. This picture was taken near sunset from Mount Scopus, which is where we get the word scope. It gives you a full scope, a full view of the horizon of Jerusalem. And I just want to pause right now and say thank you for allowing me to share this with you. Thank you for praying with me for the state, for the country, for the people there, and for praising God for all that he has done in this area and all that he will continue to do both to these people and everyone that recognizes him as Savior and Lord. Thank you very much. Shalom.